So imagine being one of the first people sent to explore Mars. As you're approaching the red planet, something strange and creepy draws your attention. There, yes, right there. Doesn't it look like a mammoth bear's head? What or who could possibly create a bear's snout in the middle of a crater? Unfortunately, or should I say luckily, there's nothing mysterious about the bear's head. It's just a facial pareidolia. That's a tendency to see facial features in everyday things. Hmm, but speaking about the finding on Mars, should we rename the phenomenon into Beridolia? You could see that coming, couldn't you? Alright, check it out. You see a V-shaped hill that looks like a nose. Then there are two craters that look like eyes. And then there's a circular fracture pattern, the head, that surrounds the nose and the eyes. Experts think that the face could be created when a deposit was settling over a buried impact crater. And the nose might be a mud or volcanic vent with solidified lava or mud flows around it. Anyway, the crater does look like a bear's face, I'll give you that. But thanks to HiRISE, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter's high-resolution imaging science experiment camera, another of NASA's amazing acronyms, we've seen many other crazy craters on the red planet. Like smiley faces, a bird, or an elephant. First, let's have a look at the famous face of Mars. These images were first taken by the Viking orbiter in 1976. At that time, the resolution was obviously quite poor, plus the lighting was slanted, which produced the result that shocked people in the 1970s – a face carved of rock staring back at Earth. Did it mean there was another civilization on Mars that had created this monument? Nah. Look at the photo of the same spot taken by the current Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. The resolution is much, much better, and the face has miraculously turned into an ordinary hill. Or look at this teeny Bigfoot, whose image was captured in 2008. I say teeny because this creature is just a few inches tall. And when the photo was taken, Bigfoot was only several yards away from the camera. And here, one curious soul zoomed in on a small rock and spotted something that resembled a gorilla. That's how some people started to believe there were apes on Mars. Yeah, really. Let me show you some more examples of imaginary creatures and faces on the red planet. Most of them come from a series of images taken by the Themis camera. Currently, it's on board the Mars Odyssey spacecraft, which only needs two hours to orbit the red planet, carrying some important scientific instruments. Let me introduce my happy Martian to you. This two-mile-wide crater was photographed in 2008. The next crater chain looks like a wasp with its wispy wings of impact debris. The whole feature was probably created by a meteorite that fell at a very low angle and broke into pieces right before the impact. Now, do you see a woolly mammoth or an elephant here? Lava flows in one region on Mars left this image on its reddish soil. The region itself, called Elysium Planitia, is famous for the planet's youngest lava flows. For example, the one that looks like a mammoth most likely formed in the past 100 million years. Eh, just yesterday. Now let's talk about love, or rather its symbol, the heart. Do you like these two hearts on the surface of the red planet? This one is actually a mesa top outlined by frost. And this heart shape is an impact crater. The hit tore away dark surface material and exposed lighter soil underneath. Then some of the material probably flew downslope, creating the heart. And this dust-covered hummingbird. Can you see its long beak and head? Scientists aren't sure how this shape was formed, but they think erosion and wind played a part in its creation. These dark sand dune deposits look like a howling wolf. And here, can you see a series of interlocking gears? This image looks like the letter T, right? The right angle fracture was created by the tectonic stretching of the Martian crust. Do you think we might find other letters of the alphabet on Mars too? Why not? And now, how about another bizarre thing astronomers noticed on the surface of Mars? Is that a door to someone's house? It was NASA's Curiosity rover that sent this image to Earth. It became viral because this formation over here, see, looks like a door. Unfortunately, scientists, due to their rational minds, were quick to disappoint us. They claimed that it was just a natural part of the Martian landscape. There were several clues that made them think it wasn't a real door. For example, the opening is tiny, a mere 3 feet high. They're sure that what looks like a door is actually an opening in a rock created by natural forces, like winds and erosion. 
If you look at the rock closely, you may notice strata. Those are layers of silt that stand out because they're harder than the surrounding material. These strata dip here on the left and a bit higher on the right. They likely appeared around 4 billion years ago in a river or a windblown dune. Since the strata became visible, powerful Martian winds have eroded them even more. And look at this! See those cracks? That's how rocks weather on the red planet. This small cave probably formed when several fractures crossed the strata. A pretty large boulder might have fallen out under its own weight. And this created the door-shaped opening. This theory is quite plausible, because even though the gravity on Mars isn't as strong as on Earth, it's still strong enough to do it. Besides, see that rock to the right of the opening? It has a suspiciously smooth vertical edge. It must be the culprit. It probably fell out not so long ago. But it's not only the red planet that can boast of having unusual formations. Let's take this comet, for example. This image was taken by the European spacecraft Rosetta in 2014. Can you see a face on its right-hand side? Or the moon? Here's its famous rabbit. It sits upside down, with its ears pointing downward. Some people see a man on the moon. It can either be his face or the entire body. If someone sees the whole human figure, it usually looks like it's carrying sticks. Sometimes, it's a toad. To spot it, look at the top left-hand side of our moon. The toad is facing upward, see? Now, look at this spinning neutron star. Such a star is a collapsed core of a supergiant star with a total mass of 10 to 25 solar masses. Except for black holes and some hypothetical objects, like quark stars or white holes, Neutron stars are the densest and smallest known stellar objects. Anyway, back to this particular star. As you can see, this space object, located 17,000 light-years away from Earth, is surrounded by a cloud of energetic particles. And this image, taken by NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, appeared in 2009 and became viral in no time. All because many people spotted a hand-like structure among all that space stuff. NASA explained that the star was spinning incredibly fast, spewing energy into the space surrounding it. This created intriguing and complex structures, like the large cosmic hand so many people see. Now, look at the Horsehead Nebula in the constellation Orion. This is a freezing cold and dark cloud of dust and gas that was first noted in 1888. This dark shadowing is created by dust, and at the base of the nebula, there are many bright spots. Those are young stars at the stage of formation. Pay attention to this extremely bright star in the top left side of the horse head. Its radiation is so powerful that the star is starting to erode the cloud around itself. It means that, in millions of years, the nebula might not resemble the head of a horse anymore. Well, I won't be around then. The European Southern Observatory Very Large Telescope has captured an image in which we can see the collision of three different galaxies. We can even observe the effect they have on each other. But the coolest thing is that, while colliding, they created a recognizable shape. Because doesn't it look like a giant space hummingbird? There are tons of weird things on Mars. Spoons, noodles, doors, even faces. Are they all really just rocks? Besides, it's not the only planet in our solar system full of mysterious things. Let's check them out. Recently, we found a strange thing on Mars that looks like a smooth, spoon-like object. It grabbed everyone's attention after NASA's Curiosity rover spotted it. The rock, with a handle and rounded tip, looks like it's floating in the rover's photo. People on the internet are puzzled about what it might be. Some are joking that it's a Martian's bowling pin, or even a shoehorn left by extraterrestrial creatures. But Andrew Good from NASA says it's not that exciting. Turns out, it's just a rock shaped by the wind over a long time. These kinds of rocks with odd shapes are common on Mars. They're called ventifacts. Ventifact is a rock that can get scratched, dented, or smoothed out by tiny particles carried by the wind. You'll usually find these kinds of rocks in dry places where there's not much grass or trees to block the wind, and where there's a lot of sand blowing around. Sometimes, the wind can carve ventifacts into really cool shapes, like the mushroom rocks you can see in the White Desert National Park in Egypt. These rocks look like giant mushrooms because the wind wears away the bottom part faster than the top, making them stand tall and slim. 
Venta facts aren't the only cool Martian rocks. Check out this series of surreal spikes protruding from the red surface. NASA's Curiosity rover stumbled upon them while exploring the Gale Crater on Mars. They quickly caught everyone's attention. Twisting structures resembling spikes looked like some extraterrestrial doors. Even the SETI Institute, an organization focused on searching for extraterrestrial life, tweeted about the image, referring to it as a cool rock. But in reality, these are just hoodoos. These tall and thin spires occur when hard rock sits atop softer rock layers. Martian spikes are likely cemented fillings of ancient fractures in sedimentary rock, with softer material eroded away over time. Again, there are many hoodoos on Earth, too. They're also called fairy chimneys or tent rocks. You can find them in places like Utah's Bryce Canyon and the Colorado Plateau. NASA is excited about these weird structures because they can help us learn more about the history of the Gale Crater. There was also a rock that looked like a jelly donut. We call this rock Pinnacle Island. It was spotted by NASA's cameras. However, just four days earlier, it was nowhere to be seen. So how did it magically disappear? In a very anticlimactic way, it was kicked up by one of Opportunity's wheels as it traversed the Martian terrain. But there's still some mystery surrounding that jelly donut. Analysis revealed that Pinnacle Island contains unusually high levels of sulfur and manganese. Both of these things are water-soluble. In other words, there might have been some water action that created these elements in the rock. So this tiny thing suddenly caused a lot of drama, and an entire lawsuit against NASA. It claimed that the agency failed to investigate a possible fungus growing on Mars. Mmm, jelly donut fungus. But not all our findings are natural. Another puzzling discovery was this thing the Perseverance rover spotted. It's something that looks like tangled spaghetti or string. Just like the donut, this mysterious object showed up in a rover camera image and then vanished from the sandy ground in several days. It turns out that it could be debris from the rover's landing system. Perseverance landed in the Jezero crater in February 2021. It had a rough landing and accidentally scattered debris around. Some of these debris pieces have been showing up in the rover's images for a while now. The string-like object is likely a piece of shredded Dacron netting, which is a type of fiber used in thermal blankets. These blankets help regulate equipment temperatures during the super-hot process of landing on Mars. It probably underwent significant unraveling and shredding due to strong forces during the landing. Thermal blankets lost a bunch of stuff back then. For example, this shiny foil piece spotted in June. The rover found it on a rock. What's remarkable is how far some of the debris has traveled. The rover landed about 1.2 miles away from where it's currently exploring. It's probably because the crash threw the debris into the air, and the Martian winds carried it over such a distance. Mars is known for its strong winds, which can move lightweight objects. However, while it's fun to stumble upon them on images, there are concerns about the debris and trash on Mars. We haven't even fixed this problem on Earth, and we're already creating it on Mars. The debris we left on the red planet is already accumulating in an area called Hogwallow Flats. Plus, the debris can accidentally contaminate the sample tubes used for collecting Martian rocks. So far, NASA isn't overly worried about this, but they're keeping a close eye on it to prevent any issues with the rovers. Now, how about not things, but animals? Curiosity caused quite a stir when it captured something that looked like a rat on Mars. Some started speculating that it could be evidence of indigenous Martian life, or even that this rodent was brought along by Curiosity. But the Mars rat, once again, turned out to be just a weird rock. It looked interesting because of the natural processes like wind erosion and mechanical abrasion. We also found some worm-looking things. Curiosity snapped a picture of a formation that looks like worms wriggling across the Martian landscape. Despite its tiny size, this formation stands out with its unique shape and rough texture. It's probably made of durable material resistant to Mars' harsh erosion. 
And finally, our top mysterious finding is the face on Mars. Cydonia is a region on Mars that has captured both scientific and popular interest. It's located in Mars' northern hemisphere. It lies between heavily cratered regions to the south and relatively smooth plains to the north. There's a theory that the northern plains may have once been ocean beds. Maybe Cydonia was once a coastal zone. This place is full of interesting and beautiful features that tell us a lot about the history of the Red Planet. But its most interesting feature was the Martian face. This thing gained widespread attention when it was snapped by the Viking 1 orbiter in 1976. Some believe that it was evidence of a long-lost Martian civilization. At first, NASA dismissed it as a trick of light and shadow. But after some analysis, it turned out to be, yep, another rock. We also saw a face of a bear. It was captured by the high-resolution imaging experiment camera. In an image, we can see a circular fracture pattern that looks like a bear's head, with two craters forming the eyes and a V-shaped collapse structure like the nose. The head likely formed because something heavy settled on top of an old hole in the ground. This hole was filled with either lava or mud. The nose-like feature is speculated to be a volcanic or mud vent. But why do we keep seeing these strange things on Mars? Sometimes our brains can trick us into seeing things like faces or objects in rocks and other things. But these are just illusions called periodolia. Periodolia is a psychological phenomenon that makes us see familiar patterns or shapes, especially faces, where none actually exist. It's because the brain encounters something it doesn't recognize or understand right away. It tries to find things that look the most like this one. So it sees random patterns, textures, or sounds as something meaningful and recognizable. That's why a chair and clothes on it seems like a super creepy human-like figure at night. It also causes you to see faces or shapes in clouds, or hear recognizable sounds and even words in random noise. It's a fascinating proof of the power of our perception, but we also should be careful with it and not let our imagination run wild. So Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. And apart from the bizarre shape, there's nothing remarkable about them except for one thing. Not so long ago, scientists discovered a strange phenomenon on the surface of Phobos, and they still can't find any explanation for it. What is this phenomenon, and what does it tell us about the history of our solar system? Let's find out! American astronomer Asaf Hall discovered Phobos and Deimos back in 1877. Did you know that all the planets in our solar system are named after Greek and Roman deities? For example, Mars or Ares is the famous deity of war. That's why the satellites of this red planet were named after the sons of Ares, Phobos and Deimos. These beautiful names actually have creepy meanings. Fear and Horror In 1971, NASA's Mariner 9 telescope took the first pictures. That's how we found out that these guys weren't at all like our moon. They had this weird shape a strange and unstable orbit. Moreover, there are no other moons in the solar system that move as close to their parent planet as these two. Well, they are its suns after all. But even though they are very close to Mars, if you were standing on the surface of the red planet, you would hardly be able to see them. That's because the curvature of Mars hides Phobos and Deimos from view. Even if you were somewhere on the equator, Phobos would look like an ordinary asteroid to you, and Deimos would look like a star. All because these satellites are basically crumbs compared to our moon. They're the smallest and least bright moons in the entire solar system, which is ironic considering their mighty names. Anyway, it seems that everything should be pretty clear with these two satellites. But nope, there's a problem. You see, scientists reconstruct the history of space based on the traces found on different space objects. Dents, scratches, cracks, all these things can tell us what happened billions of years ago. For a long time, scientists were sure that, just like their Greek prototypes, 
Phobos and Deimos were twins. But then, NASA's Viking orbiter took new photos of the satellites, and that's when they discovered a significant difference between the two. The entire surface of Phobos was covered with huge grooves. Those were a series of long, deep pits stretching from one end of Phobos to the other. You may say, what's the big deal? All space objects have this kind of stuff on them. And yeah, there are other satellites with similar grooves and scratches, but none of them has as many as Phobos. It's completely covered in grooves, and they're huge, up to 12 miles long and 660 feet wide. And that's not all. Some of these grooves intersect with others. This means that Phobos has experienced not one, but many traumatic events. But what exactly happened to it? Actually, scientists are still not completely sure. However, they have a few ideas, and these theories can tell us not only about the past of Phobos, but also predict its future. Theory 1. Asteroid Impact Well, the first suspect is quite obvious. There's a large, almost 6-mile wide crater on Phobos. It's called Angeline Stickney. It was named after the wife of Asaf Hall, the scientist who discovered the satellites. Adorable. So that's what the first theory sounds like. Once upon a time, an astronomical body crashed into Phobos. The impact was so strong that it left a large crater. And the effect of the collision left a bunch of grooves everywhere on Phobos. It sounds logical at first. However, scientists have noticed a flaw in this theory. They learned that these grooves actually formed not inside the crater, but next to it. So it wasn't a collision that created them. Besides, what about those grooves that intersect with the others? Or is it just a big cosmic coincidence? Well, the search for truth continued. Theory 2. It's all because of space debris. Yes, there's a difference between these two theories. In this case, the grooves aren't a direct consequence of the collision. Rather, it goes something like this. Something crashed into Phobos. This impact caused a bunch of rocks to be thrown into space. Some of them were lost in the universe forever, but others were small enough to be pulled back to Phobos. Passing next to the moon at a steep angle, they would crash into it, jumping away, and so on. And since the gravity of Phobos is very weak, perhaps they couldn't stick to it. In other words, these rocks were continuously pulled toward and pushed off of the satellite for many, many years. This theory explains the intersecting grooves. It's because the rocks were constantly falling into those places. It sounds quite logical, but there's another problem. We don't see any boulders on Mars or on the surface of its moons. But all this debris was supposed to get trapped by gravity and remain somewhere in the planet's orbit. This or simply become part of Phobos. In other words, if this were true, we'd find evidence of this theory under layers of dust. But that didn't happen, so this explanation didn't satisfy astronomers either. Therefore, they continued to look for the culprit. Maybe the grooves have nothing to do with Stickney Crater at all. Maybe the real culprit is something else, something even more powerful. Could it be Mars itself? Theory 3. Mars is a twist villain. The previous theories imply that Phobos and Deimos were originally pieces of Mars. Like, once upon a time, they broke away from it and became satellites, just like our moon. But what if that wasn't the case? Observations made by NASA's Mars Global Surveyor show that Phobos and Deimos are made up of elements which are mainly found in meteorites and asteroids. So, what if Phobos and Deimos are asteroids? There's an asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. Given the size, shape, and composition of Phobos and Deimos, scientists have suggested that once upon a time, they belonged to this belt. However, one day, they flew out of it, and then gravity pulled them to Mars. This phenomenon is called asteroid capture. It's very strange, though. Yeah, the asteroid capture isn't uncommon, but these two have been flying next to Mars for what, billions of years? It's weird that their orbits have remained the same. In addition, the atmosphere of Mars is very rarefied, and because of this, it could hardly capture any asteroids. 
In theory, they should have separated from Mars at the first opportunity. However, this didn't happen. It means that somehow, they got stuck. And Mars immediately began to destroy them. Yep, an unexpected twist. In this version, Mars turns out to be a villain. By studying the past, we've found some evidence of future crimes. The mysterious grooves of Phobos could be caused by tidal forces between Mars and Phobos. The Moon and Earth also exchange these, slightly distorting each other. But since Phobos is much closer to Mars, the impact of gravitational forces is much stronger. In other words, the gravity of Mars is gradually destroying Phobos. Every 100 years, the satellite gets 0.7 inches closer to Mars. It also shrinks as much as 6.5 feet, becoming even more fragile and weaker. The smaller it gets, the more the tidal forces impact it, creating strange grooves and scratches on Phobos. Yep, somewhere in 30 to 50 million years, Phobos will either collide with Mars or disintegrate and turn into a bunch of small rocks. And then Mars will also have rings, like Saturn and Neptune. That's why Phobos is called the doomed Martian moon. Anyway, these are all only theories, but the dramatic backstory of Phobos gives us an idea of how dynamic extraterrestrial objects can be. The more we learn about them, the more we discover about the secrets of the origin of not only Mars, but also other objects in our solar system. If one day we really colonize Mars, studying its moons can help us a lot. Let's hope that the upcoming MMX mission will reveal some of the most exciting secrets Mars's moons are hiding. It's staring at you, and you're staring at it. A giant eye that seems to be pulling you into an abyss. You're hovering over it in your space copter. But however scared you might be, you still need to do your job. So you send your copter down to the surface of the red planet. Right, that's where you are, on Mars. But first things first, you take a moment to remember everything you know about the fourth planet from the Sun. It's the last of the inner planets. Those are the planets that lie within the asteroid belt. They're also called terrestrial, since they're made up of rocks and metals. The atmosphere of Mars is much thinner than Earth's. It contains 95% carbon dioxide and a mere 1% of oxygen. In other words, don't even think about pulling off your helmet. Anyway, there's no time to waste. You land on the surface of the planet and find yourself in a brownish-red world. That's a good thing you're wearing a spacesuit. This place is freezing cold. The thermometer sewn into the sleeve of your suit shows minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Time to take your first step on the Martian surface. The planet looks quite colorful, and the hue of a particular area depends on the minerals that make up the soil. The ground under your feet is covered in fine dust. It looks like rust. The same orange dust is in the air. Good thing you have your own supply of oxygen and don't need to breathe Martian air. The layer of this dust covering the surface of Mars can be from 6 to 40 feet thick. You hope you'll avoid getting swallowed by some Martian quicksand. You start walking, feeling very light. Mars is just 15% of our planet's volume and a mere 11% of Earth's mass. It means that gravity here is much weaker. Its pull is 38% as strong as the pull of gravity on the surface of Earth. You jump up and down and then try to run several hundred feet. Ha! Ah, you haven't even broken a sweat. What makes it harder for you to explore the place on foot is that the planet's surface is rocky, covered with craters and volcanoes, old dry lake beds, and canyons. You see something huge towering on the horizon, but you try to suppress your curiosity. You'll have enough time to figure out what it is later. Suddenly, a massive cloud appears in the distance. It looks as if a huge herd of horses is approaching you. In reality, you better get back into your copter and fly away as fast as you can. That's one of Mars's infamous dust storms. They mostly occur during the summer in the southern hemisphere of the red planet. They can sometimes cover the entire planet, and you see the largest ones from Earth. You hop into your copter and set a course for the eye that scared you so much. Winding channels that look like veins run through the eyeball. But the closer you get, the less it looks like an actual eye. Soon you realize it's a crater. It's giant, almost 19 miles across. 
Around the crater, which looks as if it has a pupil, there are other even bigger craters. They likely formed billions of years ago. That's when Mars had to withstand multiple attacks of space rocks. But why is the I crater darker than the surrounding landscape? Scientists think that once, there was Martian water in the enormous pit. Remember those channels? They were likely carrying that water. And since the crater was filled with water, it stopped some substances and minerals from eroding away. Now, remember that towering something on the horizon? It's time to go and explore it. When you come close, you realize it's the largest shield volcano in the entire solar system, Olympus Mons. It's more than 370 miles in diameter, which is almost the same size as the state of Arizona. You tilt your head. Wow! The mountain is 16 miles high. It's also rimmed by 4-mile-high cliffs. To picture the sheer size of the volcano, let's make some comparisons. The largest volcano on Earth is Mauna Loa, towering around 2.5 miles above sea level and stretching 75 miles across. Sounds impressive. But the volume of Olympus Mons is around 100 times larger than that of Mauna Loa. The Martian giant could swallow the whole chain of Hawaiian islands from Kauai to Hawaii. But why is this volcano so large? It might be the result of lower surface gravity and higher eruption rates. Or the reason might be the red planet's crust, which is very different from Earth's. It's static. You see, on our planet, the crust is made of 15 to 20 moving tectonic plates. As plates move over hot spots producing lava, new volcanoes form, and the already existing ones become extinct. That's why lava can get to the surface through many vents. But on Mars, the crust isn't broken into the same tectonic plates as on Earth. And the lava has nothing to do but pile in one very, very large volcano. So, how about getting closer to the enormous mountain? But once you step out of your copter on Martian soil, the ground under your feet starts shaking. Well, that's a Mars quake. But how can it happen if Mars doesn't have any actively shifting tectonic plates? Specialists from NASA are sure Mars quakes occur when energy inside the planet gets suddenly released. It leads to rock fractures and cracks in the planet's crust. Another powerful jolt, and one of such cracks opens right next to you. You fall to the ground, afraid to move. But soon, everything calms down. You wait for a couple of minutes, just to be sure, and get up. Oh look! Here's a perfect opportunity to explore the insides of the red planet. The crack is large enough to send a special research robot. The planet's crust is thin and consists of volcanic basalt rock. The mantle that surrounds the core of the planet is made up of thick silicates, oxygen, and some minerals. You can probably compare it with soft, rocky toothpaste. Mars's mantle is also much thinner than Earth's. It's just 800 to 1100 miles thick. As for the planet's core, it's made mostly of iron, nickel, and sulfur and is between 900 and 1200 miles wide. This core doesn't move. That's why Mars doesn't have a planet-wide magnetic field. Unfortunately, your drone is now lost in the depths of the red planet. You leave it there and continue your exploration. Your next destination is Valles Marineris. It sounds more like an Italian red sauce, but it's actually an enormous canyon, or rather a canyon system, that runs along Mars's equator. It's as awe-inspiring as Olympus Mons, more than 2,600 miles long and over 4 miles deep. The thing is so huge, it could span the entire continental United States from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. Now let's make another comparison. One of the most famous canyons on Earth is the Grand Canyon in Arizona. But it's 10 times shorter and around 4 times less deep than this canyon on Mars. Some scientists think that Valles Marineris is the edge of an enormous tectonic plate. It moves so slowly that almost nothing has happened in that region over millions of years. And the movement of this plate probably began 3.5 billion years ago. Anyway, the only thing left on your today's to-do list is to visit Mars's moons. They're among the tiniest in the solar system. Phobos is the largest of the two. It orbits a mere 3,700 miles above the surface of Mars. There's no other known moon that travels closer to its mother planet. It whips around the red planet three times a day, while the second moon, Deimos, needs 30 hours to complete one orbit. 
Phobos is getting closer and closer to Mars, about 6 feet each 100 years. Within the next 50 million years, it'll either crash into the planet or break apart and form a ring. Happy but tired, you return to your spaceship. Tomorrow, you'll continue exploring the magnificent red planet. And who knows what discoveries are awaiting you. Have we found another civilization? Is that a door to someone's home on another planet? Can we peek through the windows? After all, it was NASA's Curiosity rover that sent this image to Earth. And right now, this rover is exploring the surface of Mars. Unfortunately, astronomers were fast to disappoint us. They claimed that it was just a natural part of the Martian landscape. There are several clues that made them think it wasn't a real door. For example, it's tiny, a mere 3 feet high. But it might simply mean the Martians aren't that tall, you may object. But scientists keep insisting that what looks like a door is actually an opening in a rock created by natural forces, like winds and erosion. The thing is, if you look at the rock attentively, you may notice strata, the layers of silt that stand out because they're harder than the surrounding material. These strata dip here, on the left, and a bit higher on the right. They likely appeared around 4 billion years ago in a river or a windblown dune. Since the strata became visible, powerful Martian winds have eroded them even more. And now, you can see that they disappear inside the door. And look at this! See those cracks? Yeah, those! That's how rocks weather on the red planet. This small cave probably formed when several fractures crossed the strata. A pretty large boulder might have fallen out under its own weight, and this created the door-shaped opening. Now, This theory is quite plausible. Because even though the gravity on Mars isn't as strong as on Earth, it's still strong enough to do it. Besides, see that rock to the right of the opening? It has a suspiciously smooth vertical edge. It must be the culprit. It probably fell out not so long ago, and Martian winds haven't got rid of it yet. And winds on Mars can be exceptionally powerful. This planet is infamous for its intense dust storms. Sometimes they kick up so much dust that you can see it through a telescope on Earth. Such storms occur every year and cover continent-sized areas. They also last for weeks at a time. But besides these annual storms, there are even larger storms that happen much more rarely. But they're more powerful and way more intense. Those are called global dust storms because they encircle the entire planet. But even if you got caught in the most severe storm on Mars, it wouldn't be as terrible as you might think. The wind speed on the worst Martian storms reaches 60 miles an hour tops. Hurricane force winds on our planet can be twice that speed. You should also keep in mind that the atmosphere on the red planet is 1% as dense as the atmosphere on Earth. That's why, if you decided to fly a kite on Mars, you'd need the wind to be much faster than on Earth. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be able to get the kite in the air. In other words, even though it's quite windy on Mars, it doesn't feel as intense as on our home planet. Oh, by the way, you might have noticed I keep calling Mars the red planet. Why? Look, our neighbor is covered in dust, soil, and rock that is rich in iron oxide. That's what gives the surface of the planet its trademark red hue. And look, there's the trademark! Nah, just kidding. Mars is the fourth planet from the Sun. Not so far away from the star, you might say. And still, it's a cold and deserted world. The average temperature on its surface is minus 81 degrees Fahrenheit. But if you ever visit one of its poles during the wintertime, bring a lot of warm clothing. Because the temperatures are likely to drop to minus 220 degrees there. In the summer, though, you might feel very comfortable in some regions. There, the temperatures can rise to 70 degrees, not very different from what we're used to. Mars is one of the most explored space bodies in the solar system. At the moment, NASA has two rovers roaming the red landscapes, Curiosity and Perseverance. There's also one lander called InSight and Helicopter Ingenuity, nicknamed Ginny. Perseverance is the most advanced and largest rover ever sent to another world. The journey to the red planet took 203 days, and Ginny traveled to Mars attached to the belly of Perseverance. Sounds cozy. And now, I'm going to tell you something really curious. Let's say you're a Babylonian who lived around 5,000 years ago. Babylonia was an empire in ancient Mesopotamia. Just think back to 6th grade. Anyway, your neighbor comes up to you and says, what day is it today? And what do you answer? It's Mars Day! Wait, what? 
When the ancient Babylonians created the week, they decided to divide it into seven parts. Each day got named after some space body, like the Moon, the Sun, Venus, and so on. Mars Day was on Tuesday. The Babylonians believed that each of these space objects influenced their lives on the day named after it. And since Mars was red in color, they associated it with aggression. That's why on Tuesdays, they had special ceremonies to avoid the influence of the unfriendly planet. Indeed, Mars might seem unfriendly to a tired traveler. Its atmosphere is very thin. Its volume is a near 1% of the atmosphere on Earth. In other words, there's 99% less air to breathe on the red planet. Mars's atmosphere is mostly made up of carbon dioxide. At such high concentrations, it's toxic for us humans. And if you were looking for some oxygen to breathe on Mars, you'd come away empty-handed. There's only one-tenth of one percent of oxygen in the air on the red planet. That's definitely not enough for you to survive there. At the moment, Mars has two moons, Deimos and Phobos. Astronomers think they may be asteroids once caught in the gravitational field of the planet. The moons are shaped like potatoes. That's because their mass is too little for gravity to give them a spherical form. Potatoes, eh? Maybe they should be renamed Mashed and O'Groton. One day, Mars will get a ring of its own. It might happen in the next 20 to 40 million years. Will Brightside be there? Stay tuned. Mars' gravitational forces will tear apart the planet's largest moon, Phobos. Hey, it really will get mashed. Some chunks of the former moon will crash into Mars, and others will break apart and create the ring around the planet. This ring might exist for at least 100 million years. The surface of Mars is cut by a huge canyon system known as Vals Marineris. Mm, sounds like a pasta sauce. If it were on Earth, it'd stretch all the way from New York to California, over 3,000 miles. At its widest part, the largest canyon on Mars is 200 miles, and it reaches 4 miles at its deepest point. If you still have difficulties imagining the sheer size of this natural phenomenon, here you go. Vals Marineris is 10 times the size of the Grand Canyon on Earth. Now, since we're on the subject of gigantic things, let's talk about Olympus Mons. This is the largest volcano in the solar system, and it's on Mars too. It's three times as tall as Mount Everest on our planet, and that's the tallest mountain above sea level. And the base of Olympus Mons is as large as the state of New Mexico. Now, scientists think there could have been water on Mars in the past. What made them think so? They found lots of ancient river valley networks and lake beds on the surface of the red planet. Plus, on Mars, there are minerals and rocks that could only form in liquid water. Mars might even have experienced terrible floods 3.5 billion years ago. These days, there's still some water on the red planet, but Mars's atmosphere is too thin for this water to stay in its liquid form on the surface. Now, it only exists in the form of water ice. You can find it just under the surface of the planet in its polar regions. The only place where this water is visible is at the North Polar Ice Cap. Also, sometimes, salty water flows down crater walls and hillsides. And there are tiny quantities of water in the planet's atmosphere. But it only exists as vapor. So, as a vacation spot, I think I'll pass. Mars is a dry, rocky, and barren planet. It's difficult to imagine that, once upon a time, the red planet could have had a landscape similar to ours. But scientists believe that this is the case and that millions of years ago, Mars was filled with vast oceans of water. In early 2021, NASA sent their most advanced rover yet to the red planet. Its mission is to search for any signs of microbial life that hint at the planet's past. They named the rover Perseverance, or Percy for short. Even Percy's initial landing on Mars itself was a scientific discovery. The rover landed using auto-navigation along with onboard cameras to track the planet's surface and find the ideal spot to land. This helped scientists work out the best landing options for future missions to Mars. Percy currently roams the red planet, guided by a new and highly advanced auto-navigational system. The majority of his day is spent analyzing rock formations. Percy is decked out with a high-tech laser that fires a tiny pinpoint beam into rocks. The laser creates a plasma from the rock samples. Then Percy's onboard spectrograph analyzes the plasma to identify the chemical composition of the rock. Two of Percy's most significant findings so far are rocks that have been nicknamed Mozzie and Yigo. 
These words come from the Navajo dialect, in tribute to a NASA engineer from the Native American Navajo tribe. Mazi means Mars, and Yigo means diligent. These two rocks are both salt-like in composition, meaning they are igneous rocks. If you're not familiar with your rock species, igneous means that the rocks were formed from a volcanic eruption. The current shape of Mazi and Yigo suggests that they have been molded by a watery environment. This could be proof that Mars was once filled with water. Another interesting rock discovered has been nicknamed the Harbor Seal. This is a dark, smooth rock that scientists believe had been sculpted by powerful northwesterly winds to resemble the playful marine animal. For decades, scientists have theorized about the wind and weather patterns on Mars. This finding seems to support their existing weather modeling of the planet. Perseus sent back over 20,000 images since arriving on Mars in February, including an internet-breaking selfie. Audio files have also been sent from the Mars mission. For the first time ever, we can listen in to the eerily and ambient sounds of extraterrestrial winds on the Martian landscape, all thanks to the rover's onboard microphones. For the first time ever, oxygen has been produced using human technology on another planet. Inside Percy is a gold-plated box around the same size as a car battery. This is the MOXIE unit. MOXIE stands for Mars Oxygen In Situ Resource Utilization Experiment. Yeah, that's a bit of a mouthful. 95% of Mars' atmosphere consists of carbon dioxide. The MOXIE unit diffuses the carbon dioxide and, through an intricate chemical process, turns it into oxygen. The unit has produced a modest but still historic 5 grams of oxygen. This works out to around 10 minutes of breathable air. It's also a good sign for what could come in the future. Who knows? Maybe one day, MOXIE can produce enough oxygen to support a human colony on Mars. For now, scientists are more focused on MOXIE producing enough oxygen to create rocket fuel. In order to propel the standard-sized modern-day spacecraft off of Mars, you would need 7 metric tons of rocket fuel and 25 metric tons of oxygen. This would be far too heavy for a spacecraft to bring from Earth. So if there is ever to be a manned mission to and from Mars, there needs to be some way to create fuel on the planet. For those of you worried about Percy being lonely, he actually has a special companion up there with him. Stowed inside the rover on his descent to Mars was a small but expensive helicopter named Ingenuity. But you can call her Ginny for short. The mini helicopter cost NASA $80 million to develop. But every penny was worth it as Ginny made history by performing the first powered drone flight on another world. Ginny was a massive scientific feat, as engineers originally struggled to design a helicopter dinky enough to be stowed on an interplanetary rover, but powerful enough to take flight on another planet. After the success of Ginny, scientists are now collecting data from the one-of-a-kind helicopter to aid in the design of smart micro-drones here on Earth. The helicopter is used to explore terrain that is unsuitable for the rover. Ginny hovers over the Martian landscape, collecting data and taking aerial photographs to send back to Earth. Ginny is powered by solar panels above the rotor blades. A big concern for scientists was that the panels would get covered in thick coatings of Martian dust and leave the helicopter powerless. Luckily, airflow from the blades actually self-cleans Ginny's solar panels. Inside her mechanisms, Ginny carries a small postage stamp-sized piece of fabric from the Wright Brothers' historic 1903 flying airplane. This is a loving tribute to the original pioneers of aviation. The Curiosity rover first landed on Mars back in 2012 and has been roaming the red planet for over 12 years. Curiosity wasn't designed to detect life as Perseverance was, but instead to determine if Mars had any of the necessary elements that could sustain life. This includes things such as liquid water, carbon, energy sources. Curiosity found a site scientists called Yellowknife Bay. This site once contained an ancient lake. The rover discovered minerals left behind from the waters, showing that the lake water was not too acidic or too salty. It would have had a balanced pH. Carbon, nitrogen, and other elements that could potentially support life were all found within the crater of the ancient lake. And most important of all, Curiosity found potential sources of energy for microbial life. So maybe there could be existing life on Mars after all. 
Curiosity made history by being the first Mars rover to witness and measure a planetary-wide dust storm. Just like on Earth, wind constantly blows on Mars, grinding away at the geology. This creates lots of dust, which eventually gets whipped up into large clouds. The dust clouds absorb sunlight and heat up, making the winds more intense. Without any rain or oceans, every few years the clouds grow so large that they wrap around the entire planet and create a giant dust storm. In 2018, Curiosity witnessed one of these great storms from the Martian surface. It noted that sunlight on the planet decreased by 97%, and many large sand dunes were left behind. Curiosity has spent more than a decade measuring the radiation environment on Mars. This allows scientists to work out if humans could safely visit the red planet without turning radioactive. So far, the news is encouraging, and the Mars radiation levels are comparable to those experienced by astronauts aboard the International Space Station. This means that astronauts could endure a long-term round trip without having to worry about radiation too much. Mars is home to the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons. This giant volcano is 14 miles high. That's about two and a half times the size of Mount Everest. The volcano was formed millions of years ago, a time when Mars was filled with countless volcanoes spewing molten lava across the planet's surface. Olympus Mons is a shield volcano, so rather than violently spewing lava and flames up into the air, lava would flow slowly down the sides of the volcano. This gives it its low, squat appearance and an average slope of only 5%. At only a few million years old, Olympus Mons is still a fairly young volcano. Because of this, scientists believe that it could potentially still be active. So maybe it could erupt at some point in the future. The Curiosity rover doesn't just eye up the local geology, it also takes a note of what's happening in the sky. In March 2021, it captured these shimmering iridescent colors in the sky, named Mother of Pearl Clouds. This colorful display occurs when all the cloud particles are nearly identical in size. It usually happens shortly after the clouds have formed. The Grand Canyon in Arizona is bigger than the state of Rhode Island. You could even fit the whole of Manhattan in there. It's so massive, it kind of has its own weather. But the Grand Canyon isn't the only big crack out there. The Valles Marineris is bigger, way bigger. It's on Mars, and it goes nearly a quarter of the way around the planet. It's 10 times as long as the Grand Canyon, and it's so deep, you could parachute into it. The Kesai Valles is also on Mars. It's made up of a series of canyons, and it might be the ancient home of a massive Mars flood. There are huge canals and canyons all over the Red Planet. There's Tiu Valles. That's where researchers think there was an epic battle between ancient Martian water and boiling hot volcanic lava. Guess we know who won that one. Equally impressive is Ares Valles. It's the longest known drainage system around. It might be weird to think of Mars as having huge waterways, rivers, and floodplains. But in its early days, Mars might have had a warm and wet climate. Now it's just dried up canyons as far as the eye can see. The Ithaca Chasma looks like a giant scar on Saturn's moon Tethys. It's four times longer than the Grand Canyon and about three times as deep. And it's billions of years old. No one's been kayaking there yet. We've only seen a photo of it, thanks to the spacecraft Voyager 1. Mercury's Great Valley makes the Grand Canyon look like a tiny pothole. NASA's Messenger spacecraft was the first to snap some photos of this massive formation. The valley's surrounded by two giant somethings, the Enterprise and Belgica, whatever that means. Pluto's largest moon, Charon, has a canyon named Argo Chasma, and it's huge. Even though Pluto's not called a planet anymore, it can still brag about its huge canyon. Even right here on Earth, the Grand Canyon has some serious rivals. Yarlung Tsangpo Canyon is the deepest canyon on Earth. It's in the Himalayas, in Tibet. Some people call it the Everest of Canyons, 
you could fit a 2,000-story building in it. The Indus River Gorge is big and gnarly. It's in Pakistan, and you could stack three football fields inside it. The Indus River, one of the largest rivers in Asia, passes through it, and it's even home to baleen whales and porpoises. The Colca Canyon in Peru is a short but insanely bumpy bus ride away from Machu Picchu. It's the massive home for the largest flying bird in the world, the Andean condor. It has a wingspan of 10 feet. In Nepal, where the Himalayas are, is the spectacular Kali Gandaki Gorge. No one knows exactly how far down it goes, but it's probably around five times as deep as the Grand Canyon. It's got it all. Crazy terrain, thin air, and it's in the middle of nowhere. So beware, only experienced hikers should dare go in. The Copper Canyon in northern Mexico is home to a world-famous group of people who run marathons, or even double marathons, just for fun. There are six canyons all joined together, and in its widest part are two of Mexico's tallest waterfalls. Copper Canyon also has one of the longest zip lines in the world, and one of the scariest train rides you'll ever take. Don't look down. Even in the US, there's a lesser known canyon that's deeper than the Grand Canyon. It's Hell's Canyon. And it's sort of on the border between Oregon and Idaho. It was carved out by the Snake River. Hell's Canyon is home to the Seven Devils mountain range. The King's Canyon is in the Yosemite National Park area. It's about one and a half times as deep as the Grand Canyon. Nearby is the second largest tree on Earth, General Grant. The largest canyon in Australia is the Caperty Canyon, and you can get paid to go there. Mm, sort of. A few lucky cyclists and campers over the years have found gemstones on the banks of the Caperty River. If you're lucky, you'll also see some 2,000-year-old rock art. The Tiger Leaping Gorge is right out of a fairy tale, but it's very real, very deep, and pretty scary. The legend says that a tiger was being chased, and it leapt over the river at the bottom of the gorge, with a little help from a perfectly placed rock right in the middle of the river. The Great Rift Valley is 15 times longer than the Grand Canyon. So what, that's like a trillion miles long? It goes through two continents and is home to about 30 lakes. It's even visible from outer space. So if you're ever floating out there in the cosmos, keep an eye out for it. The Kota Hawasi Canyon is deep, very deep. It has extreme rafting, kayaking, and hiking. And apparently the mosquitoes are pretty extreme too. There's one canyon in Tibet that I'm pretty sure holds a world record. Try looking up the Polong Tsangpo Canyon. No images pop up. It's 2021, that's insane. What's down there? Yeah, probably just a river and stuff. Colombia's Chickamauga Canyon is pretty much as deep as the Grand Canyon. Extreme sports own this place. Zip lining, canoeing, paragliding. Heck, even their cable car is extreme. It's a 25 minute ride and it's steep. Under Greenland is the Greenland Grand Canyon and it goes for hundreds and hundreds of miles. Water from melting icebergs runs through the canyon. It was actually NASA who discovered it. There's an absolutely massive canyon in Antarctica. The only problem, you can't see it. But apparently, it's freezing cold and mostly white. The sea has some mighty canyons too. The Zemchuk Canyon is one of the biggest underwater canyons. It's right off the coast of Alaska, and it's home to seals, dolphins, and whales. The deepest underwater canyon is about six times as deep as the Grand Canyon. It's the famous Mariana Trench. Make it to the bottom, and you'll break the world record for deepest dive ever. The Grand Bahama Canyon is another underwater marvel. You could just keep dropping Empire State Buildings in there, and you'd never see them on the surface. Monterey Bay is pretty laid back, but its canyon is anything but. There's lanternfish, squid, sea turtles, rockfish, and sea otters all hanging out together. Oh, and thousands of jellyfish, so take care not to get stung too much. 
There's also giant kelp around there, a seaweed that can grow up to 100 feet long. The Hudson Canyon runs from the New York Harbor right into the sea, and it's gross. Sure, it has deep sea coral and sponge formations, but it also has a whole bunch of trash and sewagey sludge coating the bottom. The Aviles Canyon is off the coast of Spain. It's one of the deepest underwater canyons in the world, and it's one of the few places where giant squid live. It's famous for its white coral and the fact that it's insanely cold. Bremer Canyon in Australia is underwater, massive, and dangerous, especially if you're a giant squid. That's the favorite snack of the local orca, the huge whale with a monster appetite. Bremer Canyon's a major tourist destination these days, especially for those looking to snap a pic of the more than 100 orcas that call it home. The Nazare Canyon is near Portugal. It's the largest submarine canyon in Europe, and it's around three miles deep. That's six of the world's tallest buildings. It forms high breaking waves, so it's become a haven for big wave surfers. The Canadian Arctic Rift System is huge. It goes all the way from the Labrador Sea to the Arctic Archipelago, and it connects the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans. So picture this. Greenland used to be smashed up against Canada some millions of years ago. Thanks to this rift system, Greenland's been slowly drifting away. Think how huge Canada would be if you added Greenland onto it. The soil beneath your feet is red and dry. The place is freezing cold. Rusty colored dust is floating in the air. You make one step, then another. It's hard to move because of the thick layer of dust your feet are sinking into. You're on Mars, and you've come here after hearing some absolutely incredible news. These days, the so-called red planet indeed looks dry and dusty. But scientists think that this world might have been very different a long, long time ago. They have found some evidence of a huge ocean that could have existed on the surface of Mars about 3.5 billion years ago and this ocean probably covered hundreds of thousands of square miles. It all started with numerous satellite images of the surface of the red planet. They were snapped at different angles. As a result, researchers managed to construct a relief map of the area. They charted out more than 4,000 miles of specific formations that had most likely been carved by rivers. Those formations could also be channels once carved out on the sea floor. Scientists used the data gathered by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter in 2007. They analyzed the thickness of the ridges and their angles and locations. Their main goal was to explore the topographical depression called Aeolus Dorsa. It turned out that all those years ago, this part of the red planet had been undergoing a series of constant changes. They could have been caused by the rapid movement of rocks, pulled around by currents and rivers, as well as noticeable increases in sea level. Researchers also noticed a pretty clear boundary that separated the southern highlands of Mars, elevated and highly cratered, from the smooth lowlands of the planet. It looked very similar to a shoreline left by a ginormous ocean. This all likely means that in ancient times, there indeed was an ocean on the surface of Mars, and a large one at that. What's even more exciting is that the existence of such an ocean might mean the existence of life. This discovery can tell scientists a lot about the ancient climate on the red planet, as well as its evolution. We now know there had to be a period on Mars when the planet was quite warm, and its atmosphere was thick enough to keep so much liquid water. What's even more incredible, the climate in the northern hemisphere of Mars three billion years ago could have resembled the one we have on Earth nowadays. But then, where is this ocean now? What happened to it? Perhaps the climate of the red planet was becoming cooler, and the surface of the ocean froze. There's a theory claiming that these days, the ocean remains in its frozen state, deep under a layer of rock, debris, and dust under a northern plain called Vastitis Borealis. 
Or, the ocean's waters could have been lost to the atmosphere. And, eventually, space, through the process of atmospheric sputtering. During this process, atoms get knocked away from the atmosphere after colliding with high-energy particles coming from the sun. Anyway, the theory of an ocean that once covered a substantial part of Mars's northern hemisphere hasn't been confirmed yet. Scientists are still arguing about its existence. As for now, Mars is a very cold world with an average temperature of negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. The planet's surface is rocky. It's covered with dry lake beds, craters, volcanoes, and canyons. The ocean that might have existed on Mars isn't the only awesome thing about this planet. Let's speak about those sandstorms raging on the red planet. In movies, they're depicted as incredibly powerful forces of nature, destroying astronauts' camps and tearing their spaceships into pieces. But how much of it is true? Mars is indeed infamous for producing dust storms so massive they can be seen by telescopes on Earth. They sometimes cover continent-sized areas and can last for weeks at a time. But besides them, there are much rarer storms that occur once in three Mars years, which is about five and a half Earth years. Such storms are larger and much more intense than regular ones. They encircle the entire planet. That's why scientists call them global dust storms. At the same time, it's unlikely that even a global dust storm could cause serious harm to astronauts or their equipment. Even though Martian storms are massive, the wind speed reaches 60 miles per hour tops. That's less than half the speed of most hurricane force winds on Earth. Plus, this comparison of wind speeds can be kind of misleading. The atmosphere on Mars is just 1% or so as dense as the atmosphere on our planet. It means that the wind there needs to blow much faster to cause any damage or even fly a kite. Now let's move to the next amazing phenomenon spotted on the red planet. When you look at it from a distance, it looks like an eye. There are even some winding channels that look like veins running through the eyeball. But the closer you get, the less the formation looks like an actual eye. It's actually a giant crater, almost 19 miles in diameter. Around the crater, which looks as if it has a pupil, there are other, even bigger craters. They likely formed billions of years ago. That's when Mars had to withstand multiple attacks of space rocks. But why is the eye crater darker than the surrounding landscape? Scientists think that once, water filled the ginormous pit. Remember those channels? They were likely carrying that water. And since the crater was filled with water, it stopped some substances and minerals from eroding away. Your next destination is Valles Marineris. That's an enormous canyon, or rather, a canyon system that runs along Mars's equator. It stretches for more than 2,500 miles. It's also four times as deep as the famous Grand Canyon on Earth. The thing is so huge, it could span the entire continental United States from the Pacific to the Atlantic Ocean. Most scientists think that Valles Marineris is a huge tectonic crack in the crust of the red planet. It could have formed when the planet was cooling down in the distant past. Another breathtaking sight on Mars is the largest shield volcano in the entire solar system, Olympus Mons. It's more than 370 miles in diameter, which means it's almost the same size as the state of Arizona. The mountain is also 16 miles high and rimmed by incredibly tall cliffs. To imagine the sheer size of the volcano, let's make some comparisons. The largest volcano on Earth is Mauna Loa, around 2.6 miles high and 75 miles across, which actually sounds pretty impressive. But the volume of Olympus Mons is around 100 times larger than that of Mauna Loa. The Martian giant could swallow the whole chain of Hawaiian islands from Kauai to Hawaii. Scientists have been wondering for quite some time why this volcano is so large. It might be the result of lower surface gravity and higher eruption rates. Or the reason may be the red planet's crust, which is very different from Earth's. On our planet, the crust is made up of 15 to 20 moving tectonic plates. As plates move over hotspots that produce lava, 
new volcanoes form, and the already existing ones become extinct. That's why lava can get to the surface through many vents. But on Mars, the crust isn't broken into the same tectonic plates as on Earth, and the lava has nothing to do but pile in one very, very large volcano. Now, if you visited Mars and decided to go on an evening stroll, you'd witness a strange phenomenon. It occurs on the red planet after sunset, when temperatures fall below negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. A bizarre, mysterious glow spreads across the Martian sky. Unfortunately, without special equipment, you wouldn't be able to observe this soft glow. Visible only in ultraviolet light, this night glow is the result of chemical reactions that occur dozens of miles above the surface of the red planet. Ah, uh, what a nice cosmic family. Meet Mars. I bet you've met him before. These two little guys are Phobos and Deimos, Mars's small moons. But it seems like Mars isn't treating the little ones the right way. Phobos and Deimos are believed to be captured asteroids. However, Phobos is gradually moving closer to Mars due to gravity, and it is predicted that it will eventually be destroyed by the planet's gravity within the next 35 million years. I won't be around then. So, I imagine this will result in a ring of debris around Mars, similar to Saturn's rings. However, this process is a natural phenomenon and not an act of destruction by Mars. Apparently, Phobos is getting ripped apart by the crazy gravitational forces of the red planet. But wait, there's more! Phobos has these crazy parallel grooves all over its surface. We used to think that they were from an asteroid crash, but now scientists think they're actually from Mars's intense gravity pulling the moon apart. Talk about a rough ride! Scientists have this wild idea that when a little guy like Phobos gets too close to a big guy like Mars, it starts to stretch out towards it. They call it the tidal force. Phobos is predicted to get stretched out so much that it'll actually break apart. Crazy, right? And the debris from the moon will form a tiny ring around Mars, just like Saturn's rings. Now, some people thought that Phobos's tiger stripes were caused by tidal forces before, but that theory got shut down because the moon is just too darn fluffy. But now, these genius researchers ran some computer simulations and found out that maybe there's a hard shell underneath all that fluff that could create grooves on the surface. But don't worry. At the rate Phobos is going, it's going to crash into Mars in about 40 million years. But if tidal forces are already tearing it apart, it might not even last that long. However, we'll still have the chance to learn more about Phobos. NASA just picked 10 rock star researchers from all over the U.S. to join the science working team for JAXA's Martian Moons Exploration, or just MMX, mission. As NASA-supported participating scientists, they'll be helping JAXA explore the two Martian moons, Phobos and Deimos. And get this, they're even planning to land on Phobos and grab a surface sample. The mission is set to launch in 2024, and we'll get our hands on that sample in 2029. Seven of the lucky researchers will be using the MMX flight instruments to conduct their research. Phobos is a real oddball. It's only 17 miles wide and orbits Mars at a distance of 3,728 miles, to be precise. Now that's way closer than Earth's moon, which takes a whole 27 days to orbit us. But Phobos is in a death spiral toward Mars and is slowly falling towards the planet's surface at a rate of 6 feet every 100 years. But there must be a reason why Mars is acting that nastily, right? What if it's all just because of plain vengeance? Well, okay, picture this. Mars is minding its own business, being all hot and watery like a young Earth. It's got a sweet magnetic field that's protecting it from cosmic radiation and keeping its atmosphere nice and thick. Hey, life is good. But then, at least 20 asteroids, each the size of a small country, come crashing down on Mars like a giant game of cosmic whack-a-mole. One of them even leaves a crater that's almost 2,000 miles wide. Now imagine how Mars must feel with two asteroids being its moons after what other asteroids did to the red planet. All these impacts are like a massive punch to Mars's gut, and its already weak magnetic field is knocked out cold. 
the core gets all overheated and can't circulate properly, which means no more magnetic field to protect the planet. It's like as if you were wearing nothing at the depth of the Mariana Trench. If it were possible, you'd be defenseless and chilly. That's basically what happened to Mars. So now, poor Mars is out there in the cold, unprotected from all those nasty cosmic rays. It's like going outside without sunscreen. Not a good idea. But at least we can learn from Mars's mistakes and make sure Earth doesn't have the same fate. Maybe we should start investing in some asteroid insurance. <laughs> but trust me, the red planet isn't mean at all. It's actually pretty friendly. While Mars may seem to be pretty tough for Phobos, there's something that might be thriving with Mars's help. So get this. A team of scientists found a way to grow rice on Mars. Yep, you heard me right. They used MMS, not the outdated way to send pictures, but a special soil called Mojave Mars Simulant. It's supposed to mimic Martian soil. And here's the catch. Martian soil has these nasty percolate salts that can be toxic for plants. So the team grew three types of rice, one normal, and two gene-edited with mutations that make them better at handling stress, like drought or salinity. And guess what? The mutant strains were able to root in soil with one gram of percolate per kilometer. Take that, Martian soil! But hold up. The rice grown in the MMS didn't turn out as great as the ones grown in regular potting soil. So the team decided to mix a quarter of the potting soil with the Martian simulant, and looky there, the plants started developing better. Now these scientists aren't just thinking about feeding Martians. They also want to see if their findings can help grow crops in places on Earth with high salinity. And get this, the whole project started when two researchers met for coffee and decided to try growing plants together. Well, isn't that nice? I suspect you're about to say, hey! But if you want to grow rice on Mars, you have to ship insane amounts of water from Earth, and it's not easy to quench this plant's thirst. You're right. You need about 449 gallons of water to only grow a pound of rice. But guess what? Scientists made a groundbreaking announcement at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference in Texas. They found a relic glacier near Mars's equator. That's right, water ice on Mars, even near the equator. This is huge news, and could mean there's even more ice just below the surface. It's not just any glacier, it's a relic glacier that's estimated to be 3.5 miles long and up to 2.5 miles wide. It's like the size of a small town. It's got all the features of a glacier, including crevasse fields and moraine bands. But get this, it's not actually ice. It's a salt deposit that formed on top of the glacier while preserving its shape. So, how did this salt deposit form? Well, it turns out that volcanic materials blanketing the region might have something to do with it. When these materials come into contact with water ice, sulfate salts may form and build up into a hardened, crusty layer. Over time, erosion removed the volcanic materials, exposing the sulfates and revealing the glacier's unique features. This glacier is young, likely from the Amazonian geologic period. That means that Mars has had surface ice in recent times. Who knows what other icy secrets Mars is hiding? But hold your horses, there's still more research to be done. Scientists need to figure out if there's still water ice preserved underneath the salt deposit, or if it has disappeared entirely. And if there is still water ice at shallow depths near the equator, that could have major implications for human exploration. Imagine being able to extract water from the ground at a warmer location. That would be a game changer. So let's see what else these scientists uncover about our favorite red neighbor. Maybe someday we'll even get to visit that salt glacier statue in person. See you next time.